candidates for two seats, how do you make sure that at most people vote for two? Um, some of these are easy to do, but like I say, they're, they're interesting questions to ask. The one here, the big one here, I think is number, number two and number three. Number two is, what assumptions do you make about the procedures and the support? Because very often the procedure is, well, let's call a voting machine company and get some help. And that may be good, that may be bad, but you sh it's something you should know about. Then the next one is, how do you record, um, how do you verify the voting system accurately recorded votes cast independent of the system? There are cryptographic methods for doing this that work, assuming all the software works. Paper trails works as well. Um, in fact, in California, uh, at least in our county, they don't count the votes cast electronically on the on electronically. They count them uh, by taking out the paper tapes and reading the paper tapes. Uh, in the last election, we had 20 people vote, uh, on the vote on the machines. The first time they were used, there were 200 people voting on the machines. This is out of 40,000. And what was really interesting um, was that many of the uh, election officials who were in the polling stations had no idea how to use the machines. Our registrar set up a small group of high school students and um, undergraduates to go around and help them do this. And uh, sometimes, the, uh, uh, in one case, they found a machine with a big sign taped on it saying, free kittens. There's a box of kittens on the machine. So it, it, the reactions were very interesting. Um, then, again, what are the requirements and how do you know um, that it meets them? How do you handle updated software? As I mentioned, that, that was an issue before. Um, let's see, what happens if something goes wrong? Do you lose votes? In one of the machines we tested, um, we accidentally kicked a plug out, and the machine lost two votes that had not been kept, two ballots that hadn't been fully stored. Is that a problem? Well, that's something you need to know. Uh, and also, um, what about corruption? Who will guard the people who are guarding the systems? This was as old as, as old as Rome, which is why I put it up there in Latin. <laughs> so um, also, when you do the testing, one of the problems we had was getting access to the voting machine software and documentation. And in fact, in the top to bottom review test, which was five weeks long, we got a lot of the, um, uh, we got a lot of the documents the week before the test was to end. And that's simply not enough time to do the type of analysis you want. In another case, we asked for a particular piece of software, and we did not get it until one day before it ended. It didn't really matter because the software was, it was the software that would load the program on the voting machine. When we realized we were going to have trouble getting it, the source code team and the attack team and the penetration team got together, spent an afternoon in Sacramento, and figured out the protocol. <laughs> so we got what we wanted even before they gave us the source code. And that's a good example, by the way, of when people say, well, we can't tell you that, we can't show you our machine or our software because that would let the bad people see it and otherwise it would be completely non-secure. <laughs> Saying that is good as one step of security. Saying that is bad as the only step. So I guess uh, a couple of takeaways. Um, know the requirements of an election so you can define what you want. This is absolutely critical. What I've said depends very highly on the definition of the, on the way Sorry, on the requirements of current elections. Change those, and a lot of what I will say has have said, I will probably go out the window. Um, the second one is you, with insecurity, you always assume something can go wrong. And it's not necessarily because of malevolence. It may simply be because someone didn't know what they were doing. And you have to be prepared to compensate for that. Um, and also, internet voting poses great risks. The specific risks depend on how you do it. I've seen some internet voting that uses cryptography that is atrocious. I've seen other schemes that use internet that use cryptography that is superb. The problem there is not the crypto, it is getting the information to the crypto. And again, to close with an old saying and a new one. Um, this the first one has been attributed to dictators under the sun. Those who vote decide nothing. Those who count the votes decide everything. I'd like to modify that by saying those who vote decide nothing. That which records, sends, gathers, and counts the votes decides everything. <laughs> An update. And with that, I think I'll conclude. First of all, if there are any questions, I'm happy to take them. If there are any answers, I'd be even happy to. <laughs> <laughs> Source 
uh, efforts for, for doing so uh, licensed software? Okay, to answer that, my view of transparency is that everything in the election should be observable. This is me speaking as a citizen, not as a scientist. Others, have, a scientist doesn't define those requirements, others do. Given that, my opinion is open source is essential. My big fear, though, is people will say, well, this machine can't be attacked. I mean, it's open source, so you know everything that's going on. And that's a big mistake. So I consider open source, it's again, my, it, but it's not sufficient. Right. In my view, as a citizen, it's necessary, but not sufficient. Yes, sir? So we, we use mail-in ballots? Yes. Uh, what are our weak points? <laughs> ah. <laughs> okay, it depends a lot on exactly how that's implemented, but here to right off. First of all, um, what's called coercion. Who's counting? No. 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 It's count actually, Sorry. the way we do things, the way at least our county does things, mail-in ballots, once they hit the election central, are actually handled the same way provisionals are, and it's very safe. What they do is they take the envelope and validate the signature. Mm -hmm. If it doesn't match, they look to see if anyone else lives at that address. And if it's a married couple, then they'll validate the signature against the spouse. If not, they will call the person and say, did you send this in? <clears throat> um, then what they do is, they, if it's validated, they open up the envelope, the outer envelope, take the inner envelope and walk it across the room and put it in a pile. Walk back, someone else comes in and opens that envelope, and that breaks the association between name and person. So who's counting them? The only threat would be if someone intercepted it and opened both. Okay. However, the coercion um, is a bit of a problem. Uh, the US mail can be a bit of a problem. Uh, and so, um, also, you can argue that selling your vote is a problem. However, the issue there is you take a picture of your ballot before you mail it. The problem with selling your vote is if you're a dishonest person, you take a picture of the ballot, you then change your vote, and then you mail it in. <laughs> uh, in California, we use what's called um, intent of the voter standard. So if two things are marked and one of them scribbled over, the machine will kick, the scanners kick it out. But the election official will take one look at it and say, no, take this vote, pointing to the one that's not scribbled out. Of course, we had someone do that and, she, and the person signed their name. <laughs> that invalidates the entire ballot immediately because in California, anything on the ballot that points to the voter means the ballot can't be used. It's one of the problems we're going to have if we switch to cryptographic systems involving random numbers because the ballots will be uniquely marked and that's not allowed under the law. So there are a lot of issues here. Anyway, vote by mail, I don't know if that increases participation. The League of Women Voters would know that much better than I do. A little bit, okay, yeah, I do know that the test they did in Hawaii with vote by phone, they had fewer people involved. Um, but uh, the security issues there are simply the coercion, um, selling the vote, and the um, denial of service and not delivering. So, in general, it sounds as good as anything. <laughs> it's, uh, no, because there are ways to avoid the coercion and the selling your vote. And the, um, and the denial of service. So, I, I, would, I would say no. Okay. On the other hand, again, it's a judgment of the body politic whether or not the disadvantages of doing it that way outweigh the advantages of doing it that way. And that's something I'm not, again, I'm not... I, not, I'm not going to talk about from in this in this forum. Other questions? Yes, sir. Do you think it would be good, reasonable, bad to have a single procedure nationwide? I'm sorry, a single way nationwide. Single procedure for voting to to better manage the whole process. Okay. Two comments. The first one is that each, I don't think you could do that even if you wanted to because of the way the states work. The second comment is that um, if you have one single procedure, then the flaws are going to be the same everywhere. The third question is how detailed are you going to make that procedure? Because in California, the state law controls how, votes, how people run elections. But each of the 58 counties have slightly different ways of doing it. <coughs> And so if you take that away, you're going to have to, the laws will have to go into a lot of detail, for example, about um, the, uh, uh, when are you going to, what machines you're going to use and so forth. So I'm not sure it would buy you much. Just. So what's the safest way to vote? It sounds like everything's flawed. 
Every, that's right. <laughs> so one isn't any better than the so, other. Um, what's the question? The, oh, sorry. The question is, so, so, so what's the safest way to vote? As of now, probably in person. Ah, yes. okay. We're going to go ahead and stop questions here. Um, but again, another round of applause. <laughs>
and actually offer a glimmer of hope. <laughs> now when things are darkest. So, um, Kristen mentioned a little bit about end-to-end -end verifiability. And this is technology that actually permits any inaccuracies, any tampering at all, to be detected. And when I say detected, I'm not just talking about detected by election officials. Things can be detected by candidates, by media, by individual voters. An individual voter can check and see if something went wrong. And when I say something went wrong, I don't just mean an attack by the Russian FSB. This includes internal tampering, tampering and corruption by election officials, by equipment vendors, anywhere along the line. This is actually possible. It sounds wonderful, right? It sounds great. Well, this technology is called end-to-end -end verifiability. And an election is end-to-end -end verifiable if two properties are met. One is that voters can verify that their own selections have been correctly recorded. And second requirement is that anybody can verify that all the recorded votes have been accurately counted. Okay? Seems really, really good if we could do this. Well, I'd love to tell you about how. I could probably do it thoroughly in about 90 minutes, you know, give you some detail. I'll give you the 90 second version <laughs> because I don't have 90 minutes to do that. Yet. But before I do, I want to amplify one other thing that Matt was talking about, a little teaser here, and talk about the importance of privacy in elections and the hard thing being that in elections, Voters must not be able to disclose how they voted, even if they wanted to. <coughs> and in the, the Washington case, I'll give a quick anecdote about this. I was doing some data entry um, at local party headquarters in the uh, 2016 election. Basically, canvassers were sent out to go and ask people, have you received your ballot? Um, have you returned your ballot? Will you share information on who you voted for? Who do you like? Whatever. All voluntary, of course. And the canvassers would go out and fill out these little bubble sheets. And I was back at headquarters doing data entry on these bubble sheets. Um, and you know, I have drop down menus. There's, the, there's nothing that I can do with anything but filling in the bubbles. And as soon as I fill this in, the, the canvassing information gets shredded. So there's no reason for anybody to write anything other than filling in the bubbles. That's the only thing that's kept. But some of the canvassers really felt obligated in some cases. And I was seeing some really interesting things. And one thing I saw many times in just my small little case, um, I'll, I'll give the clearest example of it. The response to, have you returned your ballot, was written in, I don't know, my husband took it. <laughs> that exists in Washington State. And, that, and I saw a lot of similar things to that also. That's just the most concise example. So this is the kind of thing that we enable with, with remote voting, when we're not voting in person, just to, to be aware of it. Okay. It would, however, be really nice from a security and integrity perspective if we could have open ballot elections. It would be so much easier. And this is not something that is just sort of a crazy thought. We would never have done this. Most presidents in the US were elected without the benefit of a secret ballot. It was actually 1892 that secret ballot first became common. This is what elections used to look like in, in the US. It's, it's sort of a completely open process. You go up, and you announce your vote, and people are listening, and whatnot. I'm not proposing that we go back to this. Believe me, I don't want to do it. But let's just look and think about what it would do for election integrity if we, if we did this. And I'll give you the modern version of that. A website where you capture everybody's vote. Everybody can look and say, yep, my vote is up there accurately. All the other voters, they're on the voter rolls. Um, whether the voter rolls are accurate or not is sort of a, a side issue, but that's important as well, of course. But they're, they're, they're supposedly legitimate voters. Um, and see whether they're on the, the rolls. They know if they have the opportunity to, to check for themselves. And I can check the count for myself. This is really a high integrity election. And this meets all of the requirements of end to end verifiability that I just gave you. Okay, but I'm cheating, right? I'm, I've gotten rid of privacy, and I've achieved end-to-end -end verifiability. So, 
how can we do that and actually have it secret valid also? And here is where the little bit of cryptography comes in, and I'm not going to go through this in any detail, but it's possible to encrypt all the votes, still post all the encrypted votes, and then what you have to do is provide two things. You have to provide voters a way that they can tell what their vote is and see that their vote is accurately recorded without being able to show anybody else what their vote is. And it turns out this is possible. And the other thing we have to be able to do, and this is another cryptographic trick, is show that that set of encrypted votes really corresponds to the tally. And this is all math. And I'm not going to talk about that now. If anybody wants to, to learn more about it, I'm happy to talk to you offline. I don't want to bore people with that. Um, the, the interesting thing is this front end part, where voters get to check how their vote is recorded. And basically, the trick is that voters get to see something at the time that they are voting that can give them convincing evidence. And then they go away with a receipt, exactly the sort of receipt that Mac was talking about would be very nice if you were doing home banking. But the receipt doesn't say how they voted. The receipt just matches up with the encryption that they had an opportunity while they were voting to make sure it matched up with their vote. So they can check this receipt and they can see, yeah, my vote hasn't changed from the time that it was recorded and I knew what it was, but I have no way to prove to anybody else what my vote is because it's just, you know, it's like a UPS tracking code at this point. It, it doesn't show how I vote. Okay, it's not something that's speculative out there. This is actually technology that's existed for decades. Um, and it's not just one thing. There are multiple very different ways of achieving these things. Um, but there have been a lot of refinements that have been made recently that make this practical, just at a time when we really could use this. So what's the experience? Is anyone actually doing this? There have been some small cases in public elections in the Netherlands. Tacoma Park, Maryland is a suburb of Washington, D.C. that spells its name weirdly. <laughs> um, they, they used technology that does this in public elections uh, a, a couple of times. Um, there's a, an internet-based system, which I wouldn't recommend for public elections, but many uh, university elections and professional society elections are using this kind of a system rather than sending out paper ballots, which is expensive and complicated and inaccurate for them. And this, this works pretty well there. Um, I was a part of a team that designed an end-to-end -end verifiable system for use in Austin, Texas a couple years ago. Um, it was paper-based. Um, it really met their needs very well. Beautiful system. We loved it. Um, it, it. We did it in concert with the officials in Travis County. They really wanted to do it. Um, just a quick look. It looks very much like what you expect, you go in, you sign in, you go to one of these ballot marking devices that Matt mentioned, you um, make your selections, you get out a piece of paper which indicates, you know, here are my selections, and you get one of these receipts, <coughs> these take-home receipts. And you then uh, can drop the ballot in the ballot box, go home. What most people will do with a take-home receipt is probably crumble it up and throw it away. That's okay, but they can check it on a website and say, oh yeah, look at that, my phone's still there. I can't show anybody that what, what the contents are, but I can see that by vote. I can check it. Okay. Went really well until a few months ago. It got canceled. Long, sad story. I'm ha happy to give you some details. Well, I'm sad to give you details, but I will provide details on request. Basically, they ran out of money, even though in the end it would have cost them much less. But there were some upfront costs that they just didn't have, and the existing election uh, companies really pushed hard to try to get this killed. Um, because it would have disrupted their whole current model. Uh, but it would have been much cheaper. They could have used off-the-shelf equipment instead of this ugly custom hardware that, that the current vendors sell at grossly inflated prices with huge maintenance contracts that are even worse because they've got, you know, once you buy them, you've got to maintain them. Um, they could have bought you know, cheap laptops instead if they'd done this. But they couldn't get the, the, the money for the initial development. Okay. Is more being done? Well, um, here's the centralization question that came up. The uh, uh, Election Assistance Commission um, in the US, the federal agency that's in charge of trying to create standards, um, has new standards coming out in mid-2018. 
And one thing they've done in their standards, in, in the standards that are being developed, um, this is a draft, they haven't been issued yet, but the draft of these standards say that um, elections to meet their requirements in the future should be either paper-based or have this end-to-end -end verifiable property. Now they can be both. Starbuck was both. That's the best, I think. Um, but the reason for this is they really want some way of providing accommodations for voters with various disabilities, especially blind voters. Paper and blind voters don't go very well together, even though paper is really good for elections in many ways. And this is saying, okay, here's a way to make accommodations for blind voters, use this end-to-end -end verifiability, and that's good enough as well. That, that provides a lot of this. And there's a, a paperless instance. End-to-end -end verifiability achieves the software independence that Matt was talking about, together with sort of hardware independence and human independence. Basically, any of those things that go wrong, we can check. So, what's next? Well, Matt talked about internet voting a little bit. There's a lot of push, a lot of people, blockchain internet voting, other forms of internet voting, people want to do it. There's a big, strong push towards this. Um, three years ago, I was part of a report that the US Vote Foundation uh, commissioned. And we, we looked hard at this, and what we said was, end-to-end -end verifiability makes internet voting a lot better than it would be with that. It mitigates a lot of the problems. Is it good enough? Well, you shouldn't do it without, certainly. Um, but you really should have, get some experience with end-to-end -end verifiability in poll sites first. And then maybe we can start talking about internet voting later on. But not a great idea now. So it can make things better right, right across the board. Should be done. I'd love it to be done. I'm happy to take more questions. And I've got uh, um, another slide where I, 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 I sort of answer the question, well, I'll, I'll, I'll throw this in, my subjective ranking, because the question was asked earlier, what's the best voting system? So here's my sense. In-person, paper-based, end-to-end verifiable, that's the very best you can do. Yeah, all these things. I think anybody in the security community would pretty much agree with this. Now, the next two, you know, I, I think even paperless end-to-end verifiability, in-person, is really good. Um, some people will switch this with in-person paper-based without internet verifiability. Okay, yeah. uh, th th that's debatable. Um, those are the, the reasonable alternatives. Below this, internet voting with end-to-end -end verifiability, I think is probably the next best. Again, Mac might argue, others might argue with this. Um, paperless in-person gets even worse. As a proud Washington voter, I love vote by mail as a voter. Um, but um, what's worse than that? Well, just naked internet voting is even worse. And I know of one thing that's even worse than naked internet voting. Vote by email. That's, that's, I think there's general agreement that that's the worst that we can possibly do. OK, so that, that's all I have to say. Uh, questions for Josh till the end. Um, since we're running a little late, we're going to go right into our panel here. Um, so if we can have uh, our panel come on up. Um, we've already introduced Josh and Matt and Barbara. Um, I'd also like to introduce Representative Zach Hudgens. Um, coming right up here. So Representative Hudgens has served Washington's 11th legislative district.